Hey, glad to be back. It's Bills by the Numbers, presented by FanDuel. Make every moment more with training camp underway. Steve and I examine how the defense might look different this season with more beef up front and who might be impacted the most. Steven Ruiz from The Ringer joins us to talk D-line, Gabe Davis, and our one burning question asks, who's your 2022 sleeper on Buffalo's roster? Somebody get me a turkey burger. All right, glad you can make it in for the latest edition of Bills by the Numbers. Bills Wall of Famer Steve Tasker, Bills Insider Chris Brown with you. Training camp underway for one of the most anticipated Bills seasons in decades. And while everyone is excited about Von Miller and Josh Allen and the prospects for the 2022 campaign, I'm most intrigued with Buffalo's big beef up front on the defensive line. Steve, the defensive interior is bigger, stronger, more athletic, And it's going to make a difference this season. Yeah, I'm not going to say, hey, it was an absolute reaction to last year that they went out and got these guys. Some of it was you had to. You lost some guys because of contracts. Harrison Phillips is no longer here. Uh, Starlo Tulele is out of the league. Yet um, other guys who were here, they just, they're gone. So they had to refurbish their interior in some way, shape, or form. They went out and went into free agency and got it done. But you're right. The guys they got, are big even by NFL standards, uh, and they're athletes. They're really, they've got some chops in the NFL. The exact kind of guys you would love to get. Um, Tim Settle, Daquan Jones really made a difference. Jordan Phillips coming back is a huge difference maker, and has been in the past for the Buffalo Bills. Shaq Lawson's back, although he's a defensive end. They've got some guys coming in that are really, um, you would like to think. The difference in this Buffalo Bills team up front defensively is going to be that they can play on the other side of the ball and hold the line of scrimmage much more effectively than they were able to do last year. Yeah, we know that the philosophy here is to rush with a front four and penetrate across the board. The guys in the middle don't just stand there and grind. They want them up the field as well. But I think more importantly, Settle, Daquan Jones, those two guys are proven run stuffers. And I think Sean McDermott, in reviewing last season, felt like his defense got painted into a corner against Indianapolis, who ran almost the same run play from the second quarter to the end of the game with way too much success. Right. And in the New England Patriots windswept game, where they said, we're running the ball, stop it, and they couldn't. Mm -hmm. Sean McDermott did not like the fact that his defense did not have a viable answer to those very one-dimensional approaches. So knowing he wants more cards to play, to pull out of his back pocket, from up his sleeve, wherever, this is an example of that. Now you have an answer for when a team turns to that type of approach on offense. Now they And I think one of the things last year that the Bills' defense benefited from in large measure, particularly at the end of the season um, when they're in the playoffs and pushing for the division title and when they kind of got their their legs under them offensively, Mm -hmm. was the fact that their offense shifted gears. Teams couldn't afford to go out and shorten the game. They couldn't do it. Well, yeah, you run the ball, you're going to get too far behind. Right. If you have any hiccup in your ability to convert a third down, you're going to lose the game. You're going to be a possession behind. Uh, you look at that Bills game against the New England Patriots in the playoffs. You know, you just you had to score to keep up with them because they were not coming off the field, and that's where this that game got away from New England. Same thing at the end of the year, um, and it, you know, last year's schedule. Um, it, it you know you got to the end of it, and the Bills just were were unstoppable. I mean, they got down there to that last. Uh, Let's see, this was, yeah, the, the last regular season game that the Bills, you know, win four straight, you know, at Carolina, New England, Atlanta, and the Jets. You couldn't keep up with them offensively. Yeah. So that, their bit defense and their run support, the run defense or the lack thereof, was never tested because their offense helped them out. We spoke to Leslie Frazier on our daily show, One Bills Live, this past week, and he explained to us how this new collection of defensive tackles will enable him to call some games differently this season. In recent years, the Bills needed to drop Jordan Poyer into the box more often to help stop the run because their defensive tackles just weren't stout enough, and Poyer was kind of needed to help fill all the gaps. That assistance figures to not be needed as much, if at all. 
Yeah, and that if if that happens, it's going to be even harder. Obviously, not just in the run game, but also in the passing game. Because Jordan Poy will be out there. You have two safeties in the back end with Micah Hyde and Jordan Poy. You're covering ground. You're going to end up turning it over, not just not being able to run the football, but your quarterback's going to be thrown into the best safety tandem, right, uh, in the league, along with the best corner at slot in the league, one of the top five corners in the slot in Taron Johnson, a first round draft pick in Kyrie Lim, and and of course the former All Pro. If if Tre'Davious White's actually out there in that point. You know, he's over there. So all of a sudden, just the fact that you're forcing more throwing opportunities or more dictating more passing game from your opponent into a too deep safety with those two guys back there, you know, the ripple effect of stop getting up stouter up front is going to be felt because you're right. They can align. Their, it's not just the people that, that are out there. It's their alignment and the fact that you're going to throw into the teeth of a passing defense rather than, somebody who's only got one safety high back there and taking that ripple effect a step further if you can play more too high safety looks you also afford yourself more help in the event that come week one it's Kyrie Elam and Dane Jackson at the starting corners on the outside having those two safeties back there as a safety blanket uh, security blanket is a good thing knowing you're going against the likes of Cooper, Cooper Cup Allen Robinson and Matthew Stafford right in week one that's right um, that that's a nice that's very comforting to me. Yeah, I imagine it's it very is. comforting to Leslie Frazier in the it, corners. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's crucial. Um, now, certainly, they're going to have a lot of faith in the guys they have out there. Kair Elam is going to earn his stripes. We've already seen it. The guy, he's got the mentality and the attitude to play at the NFL level and certainly the athleticism. We'll see if he's got the knowledge and of the defense and his technique and he can hold up that way. He's got a little bit to learn on that and a lot to prove as a first-year player. But athletically, he'll be there. Confidence-wise, he's going to be there. Dane Jackson, that moment's not going to be too big for him. You know, this is the guy that was in the playoffs last year for the Buffalo Bills. He's been there. Yeah. So, you know, with or without Tredavious White, this is going to be a formidable pass defense. And like you said, with the safeties back there, particularly if you're too high safety, think about this. Pre-snap, the quarterback, Matthew Stafford, a veteran guy, no question, but it's a problem to dis- to decipher what the Bills are doing in the back end of their defense when the two safeties – one of them is not forced to come down into the box to stop the run game. When they're both back there, it's going to take an extra half second or three quarters of a second for the quarterback to understand what he's looking at and where his first read's going to be. If that's the case, well, just this just in, Von Miller is now in the Buffalo Bills, and an extra half a second or three quarters of a second may be the difference between a completion or an eight-yard sack. Yeah, that's a, The ripple effects are, are, are going to be fun to watch if indeed we can discern that that's the, the real reason for it. But, man, oh, man, it, it's certainly you can understand the, the rationalization for getting stouter up front and inside yeah. where this defense was a year ago. Because we are Bills by the numbers, we take a look at Buffalo's run defense from last season. It wasn't substandard or anything, but it was ranked 13th as they allowed just under 110 rushing yards per game. It was about a 10-yard improvement from 2020 when they gave up just under 120. It's not like they struggled in this area, but they were exposed a couple of times last season. We mentioned the Colts game. We mentioned the Patriots windswept game. So that's the situation where McDermott felt he got back into a corner and didn't have a viable answer. So the question now is, Steve, with legitimate run-stopping answers like Daquan Jones and Tim Settle, and even Jordan Phillips, who loves to penetrate and get to the quarterback but holds his own in the run front in his own right, how good do we believe Buffalo's run defense can be? I think it will be markedly improved, no question about it. It I don't was know if, 13th last year. Right. I, I, you'd love to see it in the top 10. You'd love to see it in the top five. It's one of those things, you think about it, that's one of the statistics where Buffalo was not in the, a number one. No. It was not in the top, you know, that's probably as bad a statistically, a statistic defensively as they had all last year, uh, ranked 13th. They were number one in a lot of really major categories. But it was their, it was their sore thumb that stuck out, right? So – I think when you get into a game like this, and I think Sean McDermott and Leslie Frazier are sitting there going, all right, there are times in these games where we are backed into a corner. We have, we have one thing we, ha- we can do. We only have one answer instead of multiple answers for what they're showing us. Yeah. Uh, they've got to have multiple answers for different sets and different threats that the do- offenses can present. And in, that, that includes the running game. 
That includes the running game. You have to be able to defend the run from different sets and different personnel groups. They couldn't do that last year. Yeah, not with consistency, especially when a team had them in a spot like Indy and New England yeah. did, for sure. Still, still, they were in the top half of the league. Yes. Well into the top That's half of the league. That's why I said they weren't substandard. Yeah, they didn't stink. But when you're playing in a playoff game or in a game for the division title or you get into these games against really good teams like Tampa Bay you know, where you lose in overtime, like Kansas City in the regular season, you got to have more answers than just you know going into goal line defense. Right. So even beyond – the three new defensive tackles that are on this roster that will help the run front on the interior, I would argue that even on the edges, they could be better. I thought Greg Rousseau did a nice job as a rookie setting the edge in the run front. Shaq Lawson is back, as you mentioned. His greatest strength as a defensive lineman might be as an edge setter in the run front. Sure, He's always been good at that. And Von Miller is Von Miller. He's not just a pass rusher. He's a good all-around player. Yeah. He can set the edge as well. That's why, then you yeah. roll in Taron Johnson, yeah. who might be the best run-defending nickel corner in the league, and it, there's reason for optimism there. That's why I believe that, yeah, top 10, I think, is very realistic for a run Absolutely. defense ranking for the Bills this season. We move along now to the numbers game, as Steve will be given the challenge of guessing how many top 10 rushing attacks the Bills will face this season, and then he'll be tasked with naming them. We're easing you back in here, Steve. This isn't oh a tough gosh. one with Ooh. the numbers game. So how tough. many top 10 rushing attacks from last season do you believe the Bills will be facing this season? All right, hold on. Let me see. Let me skip this again. This season, the Bills have got, let's see. How many of those opponents do you think finished in the top 10 in rushing? Number of teams. Last year? How this many? This year. Well, they These finished are, last year. The, the this year's opponents. This year's opponents. Oh, how many finished in the top 10 in rushing in 2021? All right. I will say, let's see, the Rams probably did. Nine, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll say nine. Nine. That is incorrect. I'm not. You, you, the way you say that, I'm not even in the ballpark. You're a little high. You're a little high. All right. I would say I would say the Rams were probably in the top top ten of run defense. Well, I can't give that answer to you right now because that's the next question. Naming the four oh, teams. All right. So okay. first, get the number. All right. I'll say then. I'll, in that case, I'll say six. No. It is four. There's only really? four teams that finished in the top ten in rushing that the Bills will be facing this year. Now, can you name those teams? The, the, four, the four teams, teams on the, the Bills' schedule right now that finished top ten in rushing last year. All right, Tennessee. Correct. Pittsburgh. No. Green. Uh, Cleveland. Yes, fourth in the league. Tennessee was fifth, by the way. Minnesota. Not Minnesota. Patriots. Patriots, yes. And the Bills will be playing them twice. They were eighth in rushing last so it's year. Patriots, Browns, Tennessee, and. Tennessee, and I will say the Baltimore Ravens. Correct. Third in the league in rushing. So think about this. They only play four teams in the top 10 in but rushing. They play the top four. <laughs> Three of the top five <laughs> yeah. from last year. And Baltimore figures to be healthier than they were last That's year correct. when they had running backs that were on IR. Cleveland is still Cleveland with Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb, even with or without Deshaun Watson. And if you play him without Watson, they're going to run the tar out of the ball. And then Tennessee, obviously, with Derrick Henry. Right. And New England, I mean, maybe they throw it a little bit more this year with Devontae Parker, but I mean, come on. They're going to be running I formation and God knows yeah, what that, up I, there. I think New England's going to be committed to that. I think they kind of, I think they're doing it in, one, in large measure as Certainly is a reaction to the fact that Mac Jones is their quarterback, but I think more so, I think they like going against the grain where they see a trend in the league that they can take advantage of on the back, on the yeah. other side of it. Whereas everybody's throwing the ball, everybody's throwing the ball, they're all set up with their rosters to defend the pass and you catch a team. Well, like Buffalo, like they did with Buffalo last right. year in the windswept game. Now, the last coach to do that very effectively, going against the grain and running John the Harbaugh. Yeah. 
Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh. No, Jim Harbaugh Jim. when he was in San Francisco. Right, but also John Harbaugh getting Lamar Jackson, and then all of a sudden yes. they're, they're, that's what they do so well. Yeah, but I was reminded of Jim Harbaugh when he was coaching in San Francisco. Everybody yeah. was throwing the ball all over the yard, and he's like, we're, we're power running this thing. Yeah. I mean, he basically took what he was doing at Stanford, goes to San Francisco, and he's running the ball, and he had Kaepernick at quarterback. Kaepernick there, could run. Who helped. So, yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if New England can match that success. I'm not so confident they can, especially with Mac Jones at quarterback. All right, good job in the numbers game, Steve. Right now, new customers at FanDuel can get their first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just sign up today by going to sportsbook.fanduel.com or by downloading the FanDuel Sportsbook app. FanDuel Sportsbook, an official partner of the Buffalo Bills. All right, so time to discuss the defensive line a little bit further, as well as one Gabe Davis with Steven Ruiz from the ringer. He had the Bills receiver listed among his top 10 non-superstars who could shape the 2022 NFL season. So let's catch up with Steven now. All right, Steven, I w- we'll get to Gabe Davis in a second, but I wanted to start here because this has been the subject of our podcast thus far. You recently wrote a piece about NFL's most improved units for 2022. And on that list is Buffalo's defensive line. And yes, the headliner is Von Miller, but you pointed out, and we've talked about it a lot. And the beef that they have put on the defensive interior is not just big and strong from a run stopping standpoint. I would argue it's more athletic than the guys they previously had, which is key for a penetrating defensive front, the way Sean McDermott runs this thing. Yeah, I'm really impressed by the different body types they have. Just there's a lot of beef, like you said. Like Tim Settle is a big dude. There's no way around it. But like getting a guy like Daquan Jones, who's a, I think he's a little more built and a little taller, and adding him to the young guys, Greg Rousseau, Boogie Basham, I think are two guys that can compete in the run game and are willing to uh to compete in the run game where you don't really see that out of edge rushers, especially young edge rushers. So I think they just have a lot of pieces now. And when you give that many pieces to a coach like Sean McDermott, who I think is one of the smartest coaches in in the league and one of the best at getting the most out of his players, I don't think we're going to see any games like the new England game late in the season in the, in, in the high winds where they're getting run over. I think they're going to have an opportunity to switch between that, pass first mentality that they usually have on defense you know how they play more nickel than base and they're going to be able to play those types of games too they're going to be able to line up in base defense and and feel comfortable defending those types of teams like the Patriots who are going to run first yeah we we spoke to Leslie Frazier and it's like 90 percent of the time the Bills are in their nickel it's become their base defense with Taron Johnson on the slot with with three corners on the field only two linebackers and what he admitted to us was they hope that with the beef up front, they can play more too high safety, be tougher to throw the football on against. And you're right, that game against the New England Patriots when there's 40-mile-an-hour wins and they could not force them to throw the football is really a problem for them. I want to ask you about this. The philosophy that they run four defensive linemen all the – now they rotate them through, but the fact that they are doggedly stubborn about the personnel they have on the field, four defensive linemen – two linebackers, three corners, two safeties. They are, they, you can't pry them out of that personnel. And now with the beef up front, is it going to be more possible for the Bills to play on the other side of the line of scrimmage up front rather than kind of playing catch uh, with their defensive front and, and their linebackers? You know, they're kind of trying to just kind of hold the fort down up front rather than being actively in the other team's backfield. Right, like that's the NFL now, right? Being able to to defend the run while still having numbers in the pass game. So I get why they would want to play that way, having that beef up front and while still playing in those sub packages. But there are always going to be games, especially when you get closer to January, and that's where you want to win, especially if you're a team like the Bills when you've already you've already gotten over that playoff hump. Now it's time to get over the championship hump. Hump. You want to have pieces that might not necessarily help you over the long haul in the regular season, but in specific games and specific matchups in the playoffs where matchups matter more. And I think game planning matters more. I think that's where these additions are going to help more. It may take a while before you see it, but in January, don't be surprised if like Daquan Jones or Tim Settle makes a big play, a big stop on fourth down and, and changes the game. Let's move right. ahead to Gabe Davis. One of the players you pointed out, on your list of non-superstars who could shape the 2022 NFL season. And I was almost shocked 
uh, with the one statistic that you cited from Sports Info Solutions that Gabe Davis dropped 15.9% of his targets in 2021. That seems extraordinarily high for him. I was shocked by that. I don't know what their, you know, um, methodology is, you know, whether they count catchable and non-catchable passes, whatever the heck it is. It just seemed extremely high for a guy that I think Steve and I would agree is pretty sure handed. Right. Um, th- be that as it may, I-, I think the one thing that has piqued our interest, even through Gabe's first two years is how productive he's been at scoring the football. Um, you know, second on the team, I think in touchdowns last year, or tied for second with limited playing time He had seven touchdowns as a rookie, and he had three others called back on penalty his rookie year. So he could have had 10 touchdowns as a rookie role player. Um, But what is it that excites you the most about his ability to maybe kind of become a household name this year? I think people see the big size and the big plays, and I don't think they respect the subtlety in his game. That's what stood out to me when I watched him on film was he wasn't just a big guy making big plays downfield. Like, there was some stuff to his routes. Like, there's some – some some guile at the top of his routes where he's shaking defensive backs at the last minute maybe it's a feint this way or maybe he's putting his body on a guy and then breaking across the field in that Chiefs game he scored he scored four touchdowns in in each of the four touchdowns he kind of showed off a different skill set he showed off some of his deep speed he showed off some of his his strength and physicality he showed off some of his route running chops I, I I really don't think that's a fluke the fact that he scores so many touchdowns I think he's an ideal red zone target because of that size and because of that route running ability and he knows how to use his body he's not a big guy that doesn't know how to use his body he's like a power forward in the nba that knows how to be a power forward and that's why i'm looking forward to it and and that drop stat i agree with you it did not show up on film when i watched it i thought he had good hands i think it was just more of a thing of josh allen being a quarterback that can make tough throws and into tight windows and those catches are harder to make. And sometimes you might drop one or it might hit off your hands and look like a drop. And the guy that's charting the stat will, will mark it down as one. But I don't think it's really an issue with him. I, I I don't have any question marks about him. I know some people see that four touchdown game as an aberration and maybe people are kind of drinking the Kool-Aid with him. But for me, I think he's legit. And that performance was legit to me. How much of a concern is it for you and for a guy like Gabe Davis being on the offense as good as it is. I mean, is there another guy you can think of around the league that that is on a team with the quality of guys around him like Steph Diggs, O.J. Howard, Dawson Knox, uh, Isaiah McKenzie, Jamison Crowder is in the mix, and now James Cook out of the backfield. Uh, there's a, we had Josh Allen on our show, regular show, and he said, listen, there's only one football. i got to spread it around. How much of a detriment towards Gabe Davis busting out could the fact that he's got to share the ball with so many quality guys? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, if I was a fantasy player, I wouldn't be surprised if he maybe disappoints if you take him really high because his production's not there just because there's so many mouths to feed. But, like, from a football standpoint and what he's going to contribute to the Bills, I I just think they need to have that piece. They need to have that second outside guy. And you look at it's not just the receivers. Like, the whole skill group they have. They have, like, four running backs that can play. They have two tight ends that can play now. They have five receivers that can play. I know the rookie, Shakir, is, is impressed in camp so far. It's a lot of mouths to feed, and he, I've heard from Ken Dorsey that they're going to be more versatile, like uh, personnel-wise. So maybe it will be harder to, you know, lock in on a, one specific role. But he's going to be a guy that, when teams focus in on Stephon Diggs, and I feel like you have to focus in on Stephon Diggs on key downs, just because he can do, he can run any route from any spot on the field. Gabe Davis is going to be the the guy that kind of protects him. He's going to be like the Clay Thompson to to Stephon Diggs, Steph Curry. Where you take it, if you put too much attention on Stefan Diggs, Gabe Davis is going to kill you. And that's his role for me this year. It's just emerging as an elite number two. And if that happens, I think the Bills live up to all this hype they're hearing before the season. And yeah. if he performs as we are all expecting him to, he's going to be in line for a pretty fat second contract, as in 2023, he'll be entering the final year of his rookie deal. And as you pointed out, in the wide receiver bubble, probably not bursting anytime soon. I mean, the market got turned on its head with the deal Tyreek Hill got after he was traded. I mean, that just completely reset the market, maybe artificially so in some people's minds. And there's no indication that it's going to slow down if the cap increases continue as we're anticipating, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think the wide receiver market or the bubble, so to speak, is going to pop anytime soon just because of how defenses are playing. We talked about it earlier. Like we're seeing more defensive backs on the field. In order to combat more defensive backs on the field, you need more wide receivers that can win down the field and get open. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Bills handle this because they they did kind of go all in this year. They they signed Von Miller to that big deal. They kind of set up their contracts to go for it over these next two years. We see Josh Allen's the uh cap hit i think it, it balloons next year it, it jumps from like eight percent to like 20 percent yeah so there's going to be app dynamics that might play into this we might see them have to part ways with Diggs or, or gabriel davis have to choose between one of those two if davis does live up to the site and demands such a big deal so it's going to be interesting i i'm really interested to see how they pay gabe davis and and how that affects stefan Diggs spot on the roster but it seems like this front office realizes how important is to have weapons around your quarterback and we've seen that with how they've acquired players over the last three years do you ex do you expect the cornerback position to keep pace with the wide receiver spot it almost has to i think it's kind of evolved in that same way where you kind of see different body types at the receiver position like it's back in the day like back when you were playing steve like the idea of an x receiver or number one receiver was like this big guy that could play x play on the line of scrimmage could deal with press coverage now those guys look different like tyree kill does it look like your typical number one receiver did 20 years ago? And now I think you need to have cornerbacks that can match up like that. You need like a Jalen Ramsey type. You need a Trey White type. You need a Jair Alexander type. Like these guys have different body types and they can cover different different types of receivers. And if you could find a cornerback that can cover anyone like a Jalen Ramsey, that'd be great. But I think you need depth in your, in your cornerback group. And it, that's something we've seen in New England. Like Bill Belichick built his cornerback group kind of like a basketball team where he was always matching up body types. It wasn't always Stefan Gilmore covering the best receiver. Sometimes Stefan Gilmore took Sammy Watkins while another receiver or another cornerback took Tyree Kill. Steven, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Uh, we enjoy reading your stuff on TheRinger.com. We'll be uh, looking for more of that stuff. We'll catch up with you down the line. Enjoy the season. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Thanks, Steven. All right, Steve, time now for our one burning question this week, which is the following. By many accounts, the Bills have the deepest roster in the entire league. They have their stars, but every year there is a player that emerges and makes a bigger contribution than anticipated. As much as Gabe Davis might be considered by the national media, like Stephen Ruiz, I don't think he's a surprise contributor for people like you and me or for Bills fans necessarily who have been exposed right. to Gabe Davis each of the last two years. So who is your surprise contributor? to make a bigger impact on Buffalo's 2022 season than well, anyone expects. If anybody's been listening to our daily show that we do all the time, I, I think they'll anticipate what I'm going to say. I think it's, it's going to be James Cook. Um, I think with a new offensive coordinator and a guy with James Cook's skill set and his athleticism, I think it opens the door to be much more versatile and unpredictable offensively. I think you can run past with James Cook in the backfield. Nobody's going to change their defensive personnel um, with – Devin Singletary splitting out wide, or if he comes in and runs the, you know, they keep the same people. If they James Cook is on the field, they don't know whether he can split out wide and beat a corner, or stay in the backfield and take a handoff and run power yeah. uh, off off inside the tackles. Uh, certainly, his speed is an is an issue as well. So I think James Cook and the versatility and the unpredictable and un unpredictable nature that he brings to the offense from a defensive perspective. I think he's going to be a big surprise for a lot of people. I thought you might say that, so I decided to go in another direction. And I did not I did not have this guy pegged for this before training camp opened. Right. In 4 days of training camp, my mind has already been changed. I am going to say Isaiah McKenzie. I believe he's going to be a regular on offense and I think he could put up a 50 catch season if he stays healthy even with all the spreading around of the ball that we're anticipating in this passing game with all the weapons. I think it's clear there is some chemistry between him and Josh Allen. We had Josh on our daily show, One Bills Live, this past week, and he spoke to the on-field chemistry those two have. He, he astutely pointed out McKenzie is the longest tenured receiver on this roster now right. with him. He's the only guy that's been here since 2019, 2018. So that counts for something, at least as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And after watching Cole Beasley and serving as his backup, I, I think McKenzie – knows what is required from that role in the scope of this offense. Jamison Crowder may present some competition there, but I think it's more likely that we see double slots 
with McKenzie and Crowder on the field at the same time than we do one robbing snaps from the other at certain times. It's an astute point by you, and I'll say, I'll say one thing that, that bolsters it is the fact that you know Jamison Crowder, when he's with the New York Jets, killed the Bills. He was a good player, and, and I was impressed with him when I watched him, yeah. but he had some availability issues. Already in camp, it reared its head. After one or two days, he's kind of got to take a couple of days off because of some tightness. Isaiah McKenzie, he's got that ability of being of having availability. Mm-hmm. You never see him not ready to play. That's huge for this team. I think Sean McDermott values that. So that's one reason Isaiah McKenzie may get some opportunities that other t- players don't. Even when he was overworked in the New England game last year in Week 17 of 2020, uh, when he gets thrown in there, he still shows up mm-hmm. even the next week. So Isaiah McKenzie's ability to stay healthy and be tough enough to withstand the rigors of a big game and come back strong the next week, I think that, that speaks well to his you know, the likelihood that he'll put together a big year and, and hang in there physically through a 17-game year. So James Jimbo Cook, as Josh Allen <laughs> calls him, and Isaiah McKenzie, little dirty, our sleeper picks for surprise contributors on the offensive side of the ball this season. That'll do it for this edition of Bills by the Numbers. Subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use so you know when our next episode drops. And remember, when you need to know about the Bills, you need to check Bills by the Numbers. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week, everybody.